Um, I just want to welcome, and uh, I will just say the practical things first. So for the Zoom attendees, I don't know, I hope you can hear me. Um, uh, we will take your questions at the end of the lecture, but then, you know, during the talk, you can also post your questions, but we'll only take your questions after the lecture. But then for those of you who are at the lecture room right now with us, uh, you may um, ask questions during the lecture as well, if you want. Okay, so um, I'm very honored to kind of reopen this presidential lecture series, which did not happen for a while because of the coronavirus situation. Um, but I'm even more delighted to introduce you Professor Andrew Loeb, who is a mathematician in the field of topology. Um, Andrew has studied um, at Oxford for his bachelor's degree, um, later obtained his PhD at Harvard University, and also spent some uh, postdoc uh, research years at um, Imperial College London, Stony Brook, and Berkeley. Um, now he has been a professor at um, Durham Uni University in the UK, and he actually has been visiting us um, since October last year um, as an excellence chair in the OIST Math Visitors Program, which um, in fact just um, only last year uh, we launched this program. And so Andrew actually is the first visitor um, in this OIST Math Visitors Program. And today he will tell us about this kind of, at least a part of his remarkable solution to this big long-standing um, conjectures in math called the rectangular peg problem. And actually what is nice is that he has started working on this problem while he was at OIST in, back in February. And then he finished solving this problem well, in May, three months later only, uh, but still when he was at OIST. And um, there's, if I can say, a funny twist to this, which is that um, he was supposed to leave at the end of March always to go back to the UK, but because of the coronavirus pandemic situation, he couldn't really. And so he uh, stayed here as extended stay. And that's when he actually finished solving this problem. So, um, and um, to me, it was kind of interesting to observe, sorry, <laughs> observe Andrew working on this problem. Um, one of the things that he told me was that when he kind of um, had this kind of, uh, I guess, breakthrough-ish idea. Um, he let it sit for a while, one hour or so, to kind of enjoy, fully enjoy this kind of sensation, and without, you know, before actually compute, start computing it to check whether it's correct or possibly incorrect in that case, you know, it ruins his kind of sensation. And later, I was watching documentary of one of the, uh, another honorable mathematician fields medalist, uh, Mariam Mirzakani, and she also basically mentioned the similar habit that she has, so it's interesting. And anyhow, I'm very excited that we created this opportunity to kind of for you to also have a sneak peek at how Andrew views, you know, maybe some particular problem and kind of take it into, kind of recast it into a different view it in a different way in this particular problem, I mean, topology, and then so that you can see it in a rather simpler and more beautiful manner. Okay, um, please join me to welcome um, Andrew and let us enjoy his lecture today. So thanks very much for the lovely introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here at OIST and a pleasure to be given the opportunity to give this lecture. Um, that's a picture of you. Um, and you're looking uh, particularly happy in this, in this picture because you've just won a second prize in a beauty contest, um, two contestants. And you've won, you won this factory.
There it is, square peg factory. And it's the um, pegs that are square, not, not the factory. And uh, what is a, well, so a peg is something that goes in a hole, a bit like a nail goes in a hole in order to hold something down. Um, and a square peg is a peg that has a square cross section, right? Okay, so we're on the same page. So if somebody comes to you uh, once you've got your square peg factory and says, I've got a hole and it's this shape square. Um, do you have anything that will fit the hole? The answer is yes, because you make square pegs. And you can make square pegs of all sizes, just as long as they're square. So, so you can make a peg that fits this hole kind of exactly, or not even kind of exactly, just exactly. There it is. So the hole was in white and the, the peg is in pink and it fits the square hole exactly. Um, All right, but maybe you're a bit cheeky and somebody comes to you with a square hole and says, can you make a square peg to fit my square hole? Holes for us are always gonna be these um, sort of closed shapes in the plane like this. Um, somebody asks, can you make a square peg to fit the hole? Uh, you can say yes and make a slightly smaller peg and Following the rules of the game that we're going to use today, this is also a square peg that fits this hole. Right, so the point is, I've got my hole, that's just some shape, and I've got to try and find four points on that hole that form the vertices of a square. And then I say I can find a square peg to fit the hole. So even if somebody comes to you with a circular hole, get the phrase square peg in a round hole. You can actually make a, a square peg to fit this round hole because you can find four points on the circle that form the vertices of a square. And there are many choices, of course. Um, okay, fantastic. Uh, what about if somebody comes to you with uh, this shape, so it's a bit like a circle, but it's got this uh, slice taken out of it. So this is the shape of the hole. Can you find a square peg to fit this hole? Um, the answer is still yes, and it's basically the same, the same square peg. So, okay. Now the interior of the peg isn't fully in the interior of the hole, but kind of the rules of the game that we're playing today don't really require that. What we're trying to look for is four points on like the boundary of the hole that form the vertices of a square. And then we say we found a square peg that fits, fits that shape of hole. Does that make sense? All right, cool. So this is the game we're playing. Um, there's a very old conjecture, old as conjectures go, at least open conjectures, um, due to Turplitz in 1912, maybe he formulated it a little bit earlier than that, which is the following. Um, uh, uh, any shape hole has a square peg that fits it. meaning I can draw any closed sort of loop, loopy thing in the xy plane, then I can always find four points on that loop that form the vertices of a square. This is known as the um, square peg conjecture or the Turplitz conjecture, and it's, it's completely open in, in full generality, even to this day. So um, we're gonna be talking about uh, rectangles um, instead of just squares. Um, and thinking about the problem of sticking rectangular pegs 
inside holes. So there's a rectangle, it lives inside this circular hole. Um, here's a rectangle. lives inside that hole. I've just got to, again, find four points on the, on the white hole curve that I'm given that form the vertices of a rectangle. Rectangles come in different um, shapes, right? Uh, and the shape of a rectangle is given by its aspect ratio, which is the ratio of the long side to the small side. which is a number greater than or equal to one. Um, so a square is nothing more than an aspect ratio one um, rectangle. It's a rectangle. And um, the result that uh, Reiko in the introduction alluded to that I proved earlier this year with a collaborator, Josh Green, is the following theorem. Uh, Um, any smoothly shaped hole has rectangular pegs that fit it of all aspect ratios. So you can see, I guess, just from these pictures that you can find rectangles of any aspect ratio that live inside the circle. You can just shrink this one, make it, make it thinner. Um, and you can find rectangular pegs of any aspect ratio inside the square as well. So it turns out when you've got a smooth hole, um, this is always true. This isn't just a special property of the circle or the rectangle. And that's the result that we, we proved earlier. Um, and our collaboration started here at OIST. Um, and this is known as the rectangular peg problem. So you might think, if you're reading a bit quickly, that a corollary is this conjecture of turplets. So it's not quite the case. And the key is this word here, smoothly, which doesn't appear in, in Turplitz's conjecture. So although we know that there's going to be a square in every smoothly shaped hole, we don't know it for every possible hole. Smoothly, what does it mean? I'm not going to tell you precisely. Some of you, I mean, it means differentiable, basically. And that rules out things like fractals. Okay, good. So that's the thing we proved, and we were pleased and surprised, I guess more surprised than pleased, probably, that it was picked up by the, the media, and there are a few articles about it here and there. Um, I'm not going to tell you about this theorem today. I'm going to tell you about a theorem that uses, um, that has lots of the same ideas in it that go into the proof of this theorem. And this is older. This is due to Vaughan in 1981. And he didn't write it up, and um, he left it to a friend to write up. So hard to track down that reference, but the theorem is this. So um, any shaped, uh, any hole has a rectangular peg fits it. So Vaughan has dropped the smooth condition, um, but he doesn't get all possible rectangles. He just tells you there's one rectangle. If he could tell you that that rectangle is always a square, 
then he would have proved the Turplitz conjecture, but he hasn't. He's just said, given any hole that you give me, I can find four points in it that form the vertices of a rectangle. And this is the thing I'm going to talk about today. I'm not going to talk about the proof of that theorem. I'm going to talk about a proof of this theorem, Vorm's theorem. So, um, yeah, apologies. You're expecting a nice, easy presidential lecture just about the history of mathematics. I'm actually going to prove something. <laughs> um, but I promise you, you're going to be able to follow most of this for sure. Um, all right, so how are we going to prove it? So if we're going to start by collecting um, three facts, and then the three facts are going to fit together and, and give us the proof. Sounds easy, right? Okay, so let's do that. Um, the first facts are going to come from a game called, the game is called cut and paste topology. And this is a game you can indulge in if you have uh, some rubber sheets, some scissors, and some um, glue. Uh, I'll show you what I mean. So suppose you've got um, this square sheet of rubber, um, and then you're given some assembly instructions that take the form of these two arrows. So what you've got to do is glue the two edges with the arrows together, like respecting the direction of the arrows. So you've got to line those arrows up. And then you ask, what do you get? That's, that's part of the game. So well, it's quite easy to see what one gets. Um, I can even see it in ghost outline on the board as I write this. Um, you get this, which is a cylinder. Right, because you just take these two vertical edges, stretch them out, and then identify them around the back, and you get a cylinder. Okay, cool. So that's, that's the easiest part of the game. Um, all right. What about this? So I've got a rubber sheet again, and I've got these two vertical edges with arrows on. And I've got to line up the arrows. So, um, so I can do that, stretch it out, but I've got to put a half twist in it now so the arrows line up and then join it together. So what do you get? Don't all shout out at once. Or at all. Um, you get a, a Mobius band. So this is... Mobius band is going to play a big role in our later arguments. This is a non-orientable surface, it's only got one side. Um, and whereas the cylinder's got these two um, circles at its boundary, the top circle and the bottom circle, the Mobius band has just got a single circle. You trace it around. All right, it's a Mobius band. Uh, let's get a bit more complicated. So I start with a um, right angle triangle sheet of rubber. And I want to identify um, this bottom edge with uh, the, the vertical edge, following these arrows and gluing them together. So if I wanted, if, I, if this arrow were pointing in the other direction, say, that'd be kind of an easy thing to do. You just fold them together, you get like a cone. And because everything's a rubber, that's just like a disc. Um, but these arrows point in different directions, so the question is, what do you get? And this is quite hard to see. I don't, um, yeah, I think you can't see this automatically. Uh, I think one needs to make use of the, the cut part of the cut and paste topology in order to figure out what this is. Okay, so we're going to figure out what this is, and we're going to do it by making a cut. So we're going to cut this shape along there. What do we get? Well, get this. Get these two triangles. We still want to identify this edge with this edge. And we've got to remember we made the cut because we've got to glue that back together if we want to get back to the original shape. All right. And now the trick is what we're going to do is now we're going to glue the single arrows to the single arrows. Okay. Great. So I'm going to take this. Um, triangle and just lives here. 
And then this triangle is going to come round and stick onto that triangle. And in order to make the arrows line up, of course, I've got to flip this triangle over. When I do that, I get this. So you get, you get this shape, you get a square like that. Um, well, let's lose that edge in the middle, that's a bit distracting. So it's just a square with opposite edges identified like this. And this is nothing more than a Mobius band because these two arrows go in different directions. So we just saw that already. Killer. Mobius band. Amazing. Good. Um, two more shapes. Okay. Uh, this one. So now I want to identify the vertical edges with each other and then the horizontal edges with each other. So let's start with the vertical edges. That's just going to give us a cylinder. We saw that before. So we get a cylinder. There it is, stuck together there. Um, and this is wrapping in that direction. So now I've got to identify the top circle with the bottom circle, glue those things together and see what I get. So let's um, do it like this. So what I've done is I've, this thing's made out of rubber, remember? So I, I just grabbed hold of this top circle and stretched it round like this. And this kind of happened to the arrows. And you see, if I keep going, um, I can line up these arrows with those arrows and glue them together. Everything will be hunky-dory and I'll have my shape. And my shape will be, of course, a torus, otherwise known as the frosting on a donut. There it is, this is torus. It's a torus. <laughs> um, another example. So uh, I'm going to do the same thing, glue the vertical edges together and the horizontal edges together. But the thing that's changed is the direction of these um, double-headed arrows on the top. Now they don't match with the ones on the bottom. So I'll get a cylinder as before, and I can do this stretching out business again. So let's just do that all at once. But now the direction of these arrows has changed because the direction of those arrows that I started with at the top was in, was in the other direction. So what I can't do is continue to make a torus again because these arrows aren't going to line up with those arrows. And so I won't be following the rules of the construction set that I've been given. So what do I do? Um, well, I have to do something drastic. And I'll sh draw a picture, then we'll talk about it. How about that? Um, All that time. What I'm drawing is a Klein bottle. But it's hard to draw a Klein bottle because a Klein bottle always has to self intersect itself in three dimensional space. So I'm going to do my best. There, this is, a, this is a picture of a Klein bottle. So what I've done is I've shrunk this um, circle down, made it into this little neck, and then it's come in and it's like punctured the other side of this tube. And then it's able to join up with this circle sort of at the bottom and they match. Okay. But the problem is it had to kind of come in and puncture the surface at the side. Klein bottles in three-dimensional space always have to intersect themselves. That's, um, 
either a weakness or a feature of Klein bottles in three-dimensional space. Of course, there's no way of matching up this circle with that circle without this surface sort of puncturing itself. That's our first fact. Fact one. Um, a Klein bottle in 3D space always self-intersects. Always has to puncture itself in three-dimensional space. All right, that's our first fact. Um, I want to do a, another fact. Let me draw that other fact somewhere. Maybe I can erase this statement of this theorem that I'm not going to prove. Okay. So um, the other fact concerns the Klein bottle. So here's my Klein bottle. So there's another fact about the Klein bottle. All right, so I've got a Klein bottle and what I'm gonna do is cut it up. And make this cut from that corner to the midpoint and then from this midpoint to the corner like that um, and see what I get. So I get two like right angled triangles and one parallelogram. Right, so it looks like that. But there's some identifications that go on this edge. It's got to be glued to that edge. Um, the front part of these double-headed arrows, that gets identified with the front part of these double-headed arrows, like that. That's how that gluing takes place. So that means that this up here gets identified with that down there, right? And the back of this double-headed arrow gets identified with the back of that double-headed arrow. So that means that um, this here gets identified with this here. So I made that cut and, and that's, that's the result. So what is the result? Well, this piece is sort of on its own, it's just glued to itself and it's a Mobius band, right? Because the top and the bottom get identified with a twist. This is a Mobius band. The other two pieces, well, they get glued together in a couple of ways by the white arrow and by the orange double-headed arrow. So let's glue them together by the white arrow. Okay. Well, once you do that, you see there's also nothing but a Mobius band. It's also a Mobius band. So what we've done is we've taken the Klein bottle and we've managed to cut it into two Mobius bands. Is there a question? Yeah. Um. Um, yeah, I mean, so this is kind of a slightly mathy question, sorry guys, but um, the point is this is going to be one single cut, and so this point has to line up with that point, and that sort of forces things to happen, yeah. All right. Anyway, this is uh, two Mobius bands. So what we've done is we've taken a Klein bottle, and we've um, managed to cut it into two Mobius bands. This is the form of the second fact. Klein bottle... 
equals Mobius band plus Mobius band. Shorthand way of writing down the fact that you can cut a Klein bottle into two Mobius bands, or in other words, if you've got two Mobius bands, you can stick them together and make a Klein bottle. That's our second fact. That's our last fact, I think, from cut and paste topology that we're going to use. Um, our third fact is in the form of a question and answer. Fact three, here's the question. When does uh, ABCD form a form a rectangle? What do I mean by uh, a, B, C, and D. So A, B, C, D are just going to be the vertices of some quadrilateral inside the XY plane. And I want to know when, um, when that forms a rectangle. Let me draw you a quadrilateral that looks very rectangle-like. A, B, C, D. And I want to know when is that quadrilateral rectangle? That's the question. There are several um, good answers to this, uh, several correct answers um, as well. And, <laughs> and the, the standard answer, of course, is that this quadrilateral is a rectangle when um, these four angles are right angles. That's a, you know, that's a standard answer, it's a good answer. But it's not the answer that's going to be useful for us. The answer that's going to be useful for us is actually in terms of the diagonals of this rectangle. So let's put in some diagonals. There we are. Flag. So you'll notice the diagonals of a rectangle have the same length as each other. Now, that doesn't guarantee that your quadrilateral is definitely going to be a rectangle. You can make, say, a kite shape where you've got um, the two diagonals having the same length. But another property that the diagonals have is they share a common midpoint. The midpoint of AC is the midpoint of BD. And when the midpoints line up and the lengths are the same, you see that you've got to have the diagonals of a, of a rectangle. So this is the characterization of rectangles that's going to be important for us. So here's the answer. Um, when uh, AC and BD uh, have the same midpoints, and the same length. So um, that's the answer. It's very easy to convince yourself of this, of this fact. And these are the three facts that we're going to put together and use to deduce this result that any shaped hole has a rectangular peg sitting inside it. And I don't think it should be at all obvious to any of you how one goes about assembling these three facts to give a proof of this theorem. Uh, but could be wrong. All right. So All right, I'm going to give you a plan of the proof, and then we're going to do the proof. So what's going to happen? Plan of the proof. Uh, and it's going to be a proof by contradiction, otherwise known as a reductio ad absurdum. If you're pretentious or Roman, uh, 
Uh, and what a proof by contradiction means is, well, we're going to assume that we don't have the thing we want and then go on to deduce an impossibility. Therefore, we must have had the thing that we really did want. So what we're going to assume is that there is a hole um, that has no rectangular pegs. In other words, there's going to be some hole H where you can't find four points that form the vertices of a rectangle. So assume H is a hole um, which has no rectangular pegs fitting. All right, so we're going to assume that Born's theorem isn't true because there's some hole um, that doesn't have a rectangular peg. And then we're going to go on and deduce something that's false. And that'll tell us that our assumption must have been false. Therefore, all the holes must have rectangular pegs. It's going to be the idea. So what are we going to do? We'll use H to um, put the Mobius band in 3D space. So what we're going to do is the first thing, doubling the Mobius band. And I'm not going to tell you precisely what doubling is yet, but doubling the Mobius band will give a Klein bottle, because two Mobius bands make a Klein bottle in 3D space um, with no self-intersection. But Klein bottles in 3D space always have self-intersection, so that's the contradiction that we want. But it shouldn't be obvious how we do any of these things yet, because this is just the plan of the proof. How are we going to use H to put a Mobius band in three-dimensional space? Then what does doubling mean? And how do we see that the Klein bottle has no self-intersection? How does H play into this strategy at all? All right, so that's, that's the plan. Great. So um, here's H. H is just some hole shape in the uh, in the XY plane. And I'm gonna make it look particularly blobby like this. This is H. It's living in the XY plane. And I want to be able to refer to points on H. This thing we're assuming exists in our plan of proof. We're assuming this is a hole that has no rectangular pegs that fit it. I want to be able to refer to points on H easily. So I'm just going to um, start a particular point, call that zero, and travel around and sort of measure the distance. So this curve looks to me like it's got length eight. six, seven, and then back to there. Don't take that eight equals zero expression too seriously. This is, this is H. Um, all right, and I'm going to use H to put a Mobius band inside three-dimensional space. So where's my Mobius band? Um, here is my Mobius band. We're going to use this picture of the Mobius band. 
the one where it starts with a triangle and you identify the bottom edge with the top edge. You remember we showed that was a Mobius band by cutting and pasting. So what I've got to do is, given any point inside this Mobius band, I've got to give, an, give you an address for that point in three-dimensional space. I've got to give you three coordinates for it, x, y, and z. I do that for all the points inside the Mobius band. That'll tell, tell you how the Mobius band sits inside three-dimensional space. That's the plan. All right. So how are you going to do it? Well, let me draw three-dimensional space. How about that? X, Y, Z. Now, when I stick this Mobius band in three-dimensional space, I'll tell you this now, it's not going to lie um, just anywhere in three-dimensional space. It's going to lie in the part where the Z coordinate is positive. So if I think of this floor as being the X, Y plane, then the Mobius band is going to live in like level E and higher, and none of it's going to live in level D. All right? So it's just going to live, live there. Good. Everybody with me? Um, okay. So let's go ahead and do this. So what I'm going to do is put some little uh, numbers here. Eight, four, zero, zero, four, eight. I um I use the same same length as the curve to like put this thing. Um, just in a, in a grid like this. And remember, this is the Mobius band. I've got to tell you, I've got to give you a three-dimensional address for each point in the Mobius band. So let's do that with a particular point that I pick at random, or as far as you know, at random. So this is the point um, 7, 1. Now I've got to tell you, where did this point in the Mobius band live in three-dimensional space? What do I do? This is what I do. I look at the coordinate 7, 1. I travel over to H. I find 7 and 1. I draw a line between them. Okay. The midpoint gives me the X and Y coordinates, because this is just in the X, Y plane. The midpoint gives me the X and Y coordinates. And the length. gives me the z-coordinate. So it seems a little bit esoteric, but that's what we're going to do. Um, say it again. Let's take my point in the Mobius band. This is the point 7, 1. That gives me two points on this whole h. I connect them, and then I use the midpoint and the length to tell me where this point in the Mobius band lives in three-dimensional space. All right, so that's a process. It isn't um, super obvious. So this is, I don't know where it goes. Somewhere in three-dimensional space with those coordinates x, y, z. Oh, doing this a lot, x, y, z. OK. Fantastic. Good. So a um, few things to note. This is what I really was explaining was how I tell you about a point in this right angle triangle where it goes in three dimensional space. But in the Mobius band, this edge is identified with this edge. So it would be good if when I stuck this triangle in three dimensional space, this edge kind of matched up with that edge. And then I'd really know I had a Mobius band. So is that happening? And I'll show you what I mean. If I look at this point, five zero, That's really the same point as this point up here, which is 8, 5. So I'd like them to get sent to the same point in three-dimensional space so that these two edges get glued together. When I follow the recipe for 5, 0, what do I do? I join 0 and 5. I look at the length and the midpoint, and that gives me the point in three-dimensional space. If I follow the recipe for 8, 5, what do I do? 
I join eight and five. I just get the same line, so it's got the same midpoint um, and the same length. So these two points indeed go to the same point in um, three-dimensional space. So this is really telling me how to put my Mobius band in three-dimensional space. Okay, it's the first point. Um, so there's going to be two other points. Next point is I'm going to worry about um, points on this line. So this line is the boundary of the Mobius band. It's kind of the circle boundary of the Mobius band. So where do points on this line go? So let's look at this point four four. What happens? So I've got to follow my recipe. Four four. That determines two points on this curve, but they're both the same point. They're both the point four. So it's there and there. Just the same point. The midpoint of those two points is just the same point itself, because it's a zero length little interval. And well, the length is zero, so um, the z coordinate is zero. So where um, 4, 4 ends up going in the xy plane is just exactly to this point with z coordinate zero. And if I think about where all these points go, it's going to be the same story. They're just going to trace out this curve in, um, in the xy plane. So this boundary of the Mobius band, where is it getting sent to? It's getting sent to here. The curve h in um, in the xy plane. And every other point on the Mobius band um, is living kind of above that um, with positive z coordinate. All right, so I've got um, uh, this picture. Oh, maybe I don't want that to be that big. So that's my picture of the Mobius band, and this is the boundary of the Mobius band on the xy plane. All right, and there's going to be one more point about the Mobius band. And this last point is that this Mobius band doesn't intersect itself anywhere. Now, you should be expecting another point about the Mobius band because we haven't used our assumption, which is that h has um, no rectangular pegs. And the assumption that h has no rectangular pegs tells us that this Mobius band doesn't self-intersect. Why is that? Well, um, suppose it did self-intersect. What that would mean would be there'd be two points here that correspond to two um, arcs of this curve H that have the same midpoint, given the same xy coordinates, and the same length, given the same z coordinates. But then those arcs would be diagonals of a rectangle that live on H, um, but H doesn't have any rectangles. So, all right, so what have we learned? This is a Mobius band. With no self intersection. Great. And um, it meets the xy plane in its boundary curve like this. So what do I do? I double it. And doubling just means I reflect in the xy plane. Get this Mobius band down here. This is a reflected Mobius band. Um, and so what I've got is two Mobius bands that are just being glued together. And that, of course, we know is a Klein bottle. So this thing is a Klein bottle. And the top Mobius band has no self-intersection, and the bottom Mobius band has no self-intersection. They, of course, don't meet each other because the top one lies in positive z and the bottom one lies in negative z. So this is a Klein bottle without self-intersection. All 
Um, and that's the contradiction that we wanted. Um, and so that tells us that our assumption that H has no rectangles must have been false. So therefore, H must have um, some rectangular peg that fits it. And that's the end of that proof, and I guess uh, the end of that talk. So thanks very much. Any questions? Thank you for your talk. That was really fun. Um, I had a, a, a small, maybe technical question. When you cut up the Klein bottle right behind you, um, and you sort of glued it back together into two Mobius bands, and then you, you use this to say that, oh, a Klein bottle is then two Mobius bands glued together. And so I'm understanding that you're gluing them on sort of, so since the Mobius band only has one sort of circle as a boundary, you're gluing the two circles. But do you have any issues of chirality, as in sort of, are there like, aren't there like two ways to glue like two Mobius bands depending on how you would do that half twist in 3D space? Um, so Mobius bands can definitely live in three-dimensional space in different ways. But however you glue together two Mobius bands, you'll get a Klein bottle. It just might be living in, in space in, in different ways. Any more questions from the lecture room? Uh, is this okay? I had a question about the uh, the result that you didn't prove today, hmm. <laughs> which is about the uh, the regularity of the curve. Mm -hmm. So what kind of smoothness assumption do you, do you make and where does that uh, quantitatively enter into the, in the estimate? To... Um, so we make the, I think you can get away with um, C1, just differentiable, con uh, continuously differentiable. Uh, but uh, we make this smooth assumptions infinitely differentiable. And so where that enters in is we end up working um, not with a Klein bottle in three-dimensional space, but a Klein bottle in four-dimensional space. And that extra degree of freedom allows us to sort of parameterize all the aspect ratios, so we get all the aspect ratios. However, we need to use the geometry of four-dimensional space rather than the topology as is used here. And it's rather important for the geometry that we have smoothness so that we can talk about differential forms and so on. And I guess that at some point there's no way to uh, to remove like because uh, this is a uh, at first just a, a qualitative assumption. There's actually a quantitative place that it enters, so that you know after you obtain the result and you can kind of remove these assumptions later. There's some place where it you can't remove it later. Uh, yeah, I mean one can't. Yeah, it's basically you can't do symplectic geometry. Things aren't smooth. I mean that's somehow the question. I mean, the problem with um, getting some, so our result shows, and it was already known, that if you've got a smooth curve, then you can always find a square inside it. So you can maybe try this if you want to prove the original Turplitz conjecture. You take some weird looking hole that isn't smooth, and then you approximate it by smooth things. You get a sequence of squares in all the smooth things, and then you sort of use compactness or something to show you that there's a, there's a limit square in the, the non-smooth thing. The problem that can happen is that the, the squares might decrease in, in, uh, in area and vanish away to nothing in the limit. And nobody's really ever found a way to overcome that problem. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> I'm going to be very brave and ask a very, I'm, I'm, I'm not a mathematician at all. But I think to me, the magic of this proof came when there is an assumption made and there is uh, the relationship you dis established between, you know, how you transformed um, the triangle into that shape. I think, I, I think I didn't quite understand how that assumption 
um, was the basis for this transformation? Um, which, uh, which assumption? Uh, well, uh, what yes is the, assume H is a hole which has no rectangular pegs. Oh, between right. It. Yeah. So this is the where we use them. Um, that is uh, is is here really. So the fact that H has no um, rectangular pegs is telling us that the Mobius band has no self-intersection. And why is that? Well, if this Mobius band has self-intersection, what it means is there are two points in this Mobius band that get mapped to the same place in three-dimensional space. And if you follow through this process, see what it means for two points in the Mobius band to get mapped to three-dimensional space, it's going to tell you that there are two arcs of this curve that might look something like this. that have the same midpoint, giving you the same x, y coordinate in three-dimensional space, and the same length as each other, giving you the z, same z coordinate in three-dimensional space. And that's going to tell you that there was a rectangle. But because there isn't a rectangle, you know that can't happen, so that's what's telling you the Mobius band has no solvent. Anybody else? Thank you for a great lecture. Um, so, sorry for this question, because I'm not a mathematician, but uh, part of being uh, this kind of fundamental research, uh, does it have any like applied um, idea here? Like, uh, I don't know, could it be helpful in understanding the nature of black hole or time traveling or something like that? Thank you. Well, the assumption right at the beginning of the lecture was that you'd inherited a square peg factory. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I mean, the result quite useful from that point of view, because you know you can fulfill all of society's needs. But um, in terms of um, applications, I don't really think there are any. I mean, this was 1912. This is back before um, relativity and so on had entered the picture and math and physics had, had um, not really meshed in the way that they did in the next few years. Um, no, this is just a problem that's intriguing because it's so simple to state and yet apparently so, so hard to make any traction with. Um, so no, we don't, I don't think there are necessarily any applications for this. One thing it suggests is that um, one should maybe be thinking about applying modern day techniques to these old problems because our proof of the rectangular peg problem was really very quick once it had the idea to use symplectic geometry and the main body of the proof really only took like a page um, and so it might be um, it might be an opportunity for enterprising mathematicians to go back and look at some of these old conjectures and see whether up-to-date techniques can really be applied Uh, I'll open the questions to the Zoom attendees. No? <laughs> uh, for those of you who are attending uh, via Zoom, do you have questions? Okay. Could you also type it, type your question in the Zoom somehow? Uh, please click the Q&A button at the bottom center of your screen. Okay, so the question is, do we assume that the curve does not have self intersections? Um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think, yeah, that's, yeah. Yes, we do.
<laughs> Follow up questions are welcome too. So. Also, uh, if are there any other questions also from this room? No. All right. Um, if not, then if not on Zoom, then let's thank Andrew again for this wonderful lecture. Thank you.